<laughs> My experience as chairman for the last nine years, absolutely fascinating uh, and, and, and great fun. Uh, and I have to say, hugely rewarding. Uh, largely because actually you're doing things which were outside my normal areas of expertise. So I have to say I worked with some wonderful people at the CISI and I really think we did actually and have done something which has made a difference, which is very satisfying. I decided that why be an architect when you're at the behest of the economic cycle. In economic cycles like this, architects get very busy on the way up and very unbusy on the way down. And the whole idea about being professionally qualified is you're supposed to smooth those cycles out. So I decided that wasn't a good idea, so I didn't do it. My great-grandfather was a great inspiration. He was an extraordinary person. He was a very good engineer, and he built a business from nothing to being a very large business uh, in the country. It's called Yarrow Shipbuilders in those days. And when he died, he had given the equivalent of 85 million to uh, charitable causes. He was the person who said to me, actually, you know, you've got to create wealth before you can spend it to help those who can't help themselves. And that's the ethos I've been brought up on. As Lord Mayor, you are, in protocol terms, the most important person in the city. You're even more important, ironically, than the Queen. And the Queen has to ask permission to come into the city. The Prime Minister has to answer your question, because he's junior to you when he comes to the city. This is the power of influence, soft power. It's an incredibly powerful position. And, you know, that's what I hoped some of it transferred to the profile of the CISI. The point about what we've been trying to do in the years I've been here is to get recognition for the Institute. Not recognition amongst the people who effectively it works for, because they know it, but those people who don't, in other words, those people in power. You know, we really wanted to raise the profile of the CISI, and I think that's probably what we were working on, and I hope we achieved it. And the City of London is the largest international financial centre in the world, respected because of the rule of law, dispute resolution, you know, the law of contract is incredibly important. So all these things come together as being the central market, and that gives us a huge platform. I, I'm a great believer in selling a good product, and I think we have a great product here. It doesn't really matter if it's a hard Brexit, soft Brexit, no Brexit. The whole concept about being more professional focusing on ethics and integrity, and making sure that we actually get out there and proselytize what is good behavior to people, it won't change, it'll continue. And I know we've got some extremely good people who will do a wonderful job. So I've got nothing but the greatest of hopes for the CISI. Ethics and integrity is an important part of the city. And values have been lost, and greed was prevalent. When I was asked to do the job, I didn't say yes straight away. Uh, and I very rarely do say yes straight away when I'm asked to do a job, but this one was particularly difficult. Having been a chairman of a bank and been involved in capital markets all my life, I find it quite strange to be someone who's going to be chairing an institute which is judging people on their ethics and integrity, when most of the reputation of the areas where I was, was that they weren't very high up on the moral standards. I hold behaviour very high, and markets need to be clean. Uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, you need to have good price discovery in markets, and that means there's got to be honesty. And if you start getting dishonesty, so markets start to collapse and capital, capital becomes more expensive. So I'm a great believer in making sure that the markets are transparent and trusted. That, you know, it's, the, that's a very small minority who misbehave, but it's the damage that small minority can do. And what I loved about working at the CISI is you've got 750 volunteers giving their time for free to help the industry solve its own problems. And that is very powerful. I think we are blessed by having a good governor of the Bank of England who effectively sits at the top of what I describe as the regulatory side. And he's got the message that actually the industry cannot just rely on regulation to get itself right. 
And I think that's the point about the CISI, that we got that years ago. We got that and we recognised the fact that actually the industry has to repair itself. It's not about someone coming from the outside, you should do this, you should do that. It's because it's the right thing to do. And it's so often the case that people think, well, you can do something because it's legal. But I can show you all sorts of examples that when it's legal doesn't necessarily mean it's right. You know, ethics do stand way above what's legal. Uh, and that's down to a person's judgment. You can't just tackle cybercrime. Uh, cybercrime is dynamic. By definition, it's always moving. And uh, the people who are crooked are nearly always moving faster than the people they're robbing or they're thieving of. So this is a dynamic situation. Cyber is dynamic. We haven't even touched on quantum computing yet, and we're only in other, basically on two-dimensional stuff. So you know, these are huge areas of concern, but we need to be very, very uh, careful about cybercrime. And it's never going to be solved. It's always going to be there. The biggest vulnerability of cyber, basically, is your own staff. And it's not a criticism. It's that you, as management, have a duty to make sure your staff are properly trained to minimise the impact of cyber on the company you're working for. And they also have to minimise the impact of cyber on their own personal lives. You know, when you have effectively people trolling them, maybe on social media, uh, and bullying them through what might be going on, right the way through to taking money off their account. But I've always believed in diversity as being a thoroughly good thing, because I think different attitudes and approaches to subjects illustrates a far better depth of response. I think it's coming through. Slowly but surely, you're getting a far better understanding. And when it comes to mental health, depression, uh, schizophrenia, all these things, we need to get better at coping with it. And we should actually nurture them, make sure they can deliver their best. So we give them support. Uh, if you're somebody who uh, is dyslexic, uh, I'm not saying it's a mental illness, but you might be dyslexic, you might have a different mental power looking at something in a different way. I mean, for example, my background is I did art, right? So I'm, my background is art. Uh, my, my, my son is also, my eldest son is disabled. So I've got, you know, I've got both in a sense. So I look at things from shapes and sizes and colours and movement and think how things work. Whilst a, uh, an engineer will probably be looking at things from a different perspective. So it's about the mixture of ability. Uh, Kipling, if, I think it's wonderful. When I first became chairman of the CISI, the article was, was structured on if. Uh, Robert Kennedy's speech in 1968 basically says, he talks about GDP or GNP, and he says GNP counts the cost of the napalm that's being produced, the tanks that are being produced by the army, the violence which produces the toys which the toy manufacturers want to sell, but it doesn't count the value of your family the beauty of the countryside, the truth of our poetry. And, and it's just one of the best speeches I've ever read. And I've used it a lot in my business as a little matter. I said, you know, it's not about just the money. It's also about the culture and where we live. And the other one, uh, the, the third one is the On Sec by, by uh, John Betjeman. Yes, I've got, I've got a tip actually, I've got a tip. One is to be enthusiastic. And you say, why? And I say, because actually, if you are enthusiastic, you're allowed to make mistakes. Hmm? If you're a cynic and constantly criticizing, people don't actually give you a lot of slack. Two, try and find a mentor in an organization. And the reason why I say that is because actually, if you want to go up in an organization, having someone who's above you actually just directing you as to where things are happening gives you a third dimension. Otherwise, you sit back in where you are, and all you get is the gossip uh, and the stuff coming down from you, which is dictated rather than actually being, having conversation. So talk to senior management, actually, and you know, find somebody who you've got an affinity with who can actually offer you thoughts and suggestions which you might not have thought of. Presentation training, speech training, all this stuff, which looks like rather soft, not necessary. It's all very good training. Well, other than that, I think you know, make sure you take a lot of exercise and you're not just sitting at the bottom all day, but you are actually getting out there and playing some sport and getting on with things. I'd just like to remember as a decent person with a sense of humour. <laughs>